Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and today I'm going to talk about the film The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. Because there are three Hobbit films that are coming out, the first of which comes out at the end of this week, and there are three animated Tolkien films, and there are also three Lord of the Rings films, I thought every time a Hobbit film would come out, I would review one of each of those kind of trilogies. I already reviewed the animated Hobbit, and now I'm going to review the first of the Lord of the Rings films. Set in Middle-earth, the Dark Lord Sauron, who's looking for the one ring that will rule them all. And that ring is in the possession of Frodo Baggins. It was given to him by his uncle Bilbo Baggins, who is deeply kind of troubled and obsessed with it. And he is instructed to help go destroy it. There forms a fellowship with Gimli the Dwarf, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, or Strider, Gandalf, and Samwise Ganji, his trusty assistant, Merry and Pippin, two other hobbits, Legolas, who's an archer, elf, and Boromir. They've been instructed to help Frodo take the ring to Mount Doom in Mordor, where it can be destroyed in the fiery lava pit. This movie came out when I was a senior in high school. I had been hearing about this film being made for a long time, and although I never read the actual Lord of the Rings books, I attempted to read them several times, but I was never successful. But I did grow up watching the Bakshi Lord of the Rings film quite a few times, and The Return of the King, the follow-up kind of. I was really into that, and I was into the whole Tolkien mythology, but I always thought it would make a cool movie. And then when I heard through Ain't It Cool News that The Lord of the Rings was going to be made into three separate films, and they'd release them one every year, and they were going to shoot them all at one time as this one massive project. And it seemed just really cool, and I was really excited. And it was also like, this could either be a huge success or an outright disaster. And I kind of thought it would probably be successful, but I don't think I knew at that time that kind of the mark it was going to have on pop culture. And I don't think anyone did, because fantasy films had really been gone for a majority of the 90s. So The Fellowship of the Ring came out the same year as the first Harry Potter film, and then suddenly fantasy was back, and fantasy was box office. I saw it the first day it came out. I really didn't do that too much then, but you know, even though I had high school and this I think came out on a Wednesday, I was like, no, I'm gonna go see Fellowship of the Ring. And I just wanted to be there for that day. It was a movie I'd been excited for. I watched Peter Jackson's previous films before this came. I mean, I had known about this film being made for so long, I had enough time to catch up. Just like the publicity in making this film was pretty much how I knew who Peter Jackson was. I, I mean, I had heard of Heavenly Creatures, I had heard of the Frighteners, but I hadn't bothered to see them until I heard about Lord of the Rings being made. When I look back on that time, it was just like so exciting because Star Wars had kind of happened before I was born, but there really hadn't been a big event movie for my generation. Like a big event film that you absolutely loved and cherished and didn't just like because of the spectacle of it. Like this big, epic, kind of almost unexpected big movie franchise. Part of me, the sadistic side of me, did kind of think it'd be funny if they all flopped and it was a huge financial disaster. But after seeing The Fellowship of the Ring, I, I wanted it to be a huge success because it was a glorious, epic, of a fantasy movie. Peter Jackson, I heard, I think it was Ebert who said this, but someone said that Peter Jackson shoots like a silent film director. And I think that's really true because a lot of the shots, especially with the ring race, a lot of the shots that convey strong visuals seem more like a silent film director, but also it seems like he knows a lot about animation. There's a couple shots that people have said, and I think Peter Jackson has said, are referencing the Bakshi Lord of the Rings, particularly when the ring wraith is right near the tree where all the hobbits are hiding, apparently is referencing Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. There's the shot where the ring race come into the prancing pony, and you see that blade come in the background, and the guy's face is like, and it's like such a strong visual shot. It reminds me of like classic Walt Disney kind of animation. And that reminds me a lot of Spielberg because Spielberg has been very open about how he's influenced by animation. He often cites the old mill as a great animated short, one of the best shorts of all time, I believe he said that. And I can see that kind of love of animation and love of graphic art throughout this film. They really looked at this as a very visual world. And the camera in this film, it's almost chaotic, like how many different shots are put into one scene. A lot of scenes in a lot of movies usually have the same camera set up and then you keep going back to those various cameras. 
almost like in a TV fashion. In this film, you'll literally never go back to a camera setup in a scene. You'll just go to it once. There's so many different camera setups and shots, and you know, since they have to do the forced perspective with the hobbits to make them look small, all the shots they had to do to put together to make this film, it seems like a puzzle of editing when I watch it now. That just looks like it took forever to shoot a simple dialogue sequence, but it looks amazing. I can't imagine it being shot in any other way. In a more simpler way, I think this film would have been a lot duller, but this film moves at such a brisk pace. I will admit though, I don't own the theatrical edition. I own the extended edition. I own all the extended editions. So I'm mostly talking about, and I'm really reviewing the extended edition. However, I will say this film moves, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the camera setups change so often. It moves at such an incredible pace. Like at the end of the film, and this is like, I don't know, it's like almost four hours or something. It's definitely over three hours. It's, I think it's like 200 minutes. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, I could watch The Two Towers right now. And I've done that before. I've watched all three extended editions back to back. And it is like kind of almost like watching a whole season of a TV show in a night because you just get so wrapped up in it. I saw this, I think, three times in the theaters, but I feel like maybe even more because I saw it once by myself the first day and then I saw it with my dad. And then I saw it with my dad and his friend Michael Powell. It's actually the last time I've seen him, which is unfortunate. It's about 2001. And uh, he, he used to, but he's still alive and stuff, but he used to um, play Magic the Gathering with my dad and they would talk about Tolkien stuff and I remember hearing them talk about Tolkien stuff when they played Magic the Gathering or you know I'd ask them questions that I had from the Bakshi film and then I got to see the film with Michael Powell and my dad and he, he liked it I mean he understood some of the changes they had to make a lot of people complain about the changes I mean I guess I can't really speak about that because I haven't read the book but I've always kind of felt, and the way when I was following all that online marketing stuff, was that Peter Jackson always said, if you want to see someone make a Lord of the Rings movie and the sacrifices we have to make to make this a movie and not an unabridged adaptation, then this will be the movie for you. But if you think it has to be, you know, everything has to be in this film, you'll never like these movies. That's the better attitude to have. People complain there's not songs in it. I really didn't think they were going to put songs in your big fantasy action epic. That's actually too much. Some parts are obviously products of their time. The main orc army guy looks very, you know, 2001 bad guy, but I kind of always overlook that. And even if you look at great films like The Wizard of Oz, that still looks like it was made in 39, as timeless as it is. I remember reading a thing from Harry Knowles, and it was about how Ian McKellen's probably not going to win the Oscar, and it went to Jim Broadbent that year. And I thought Ian McKellen was so perfect and so amazing. But he said something like, it doesn't really matter if, if Ian McKellen wins the Oscar or not, because in 40 years, and you go down the list of Best Supporting Actor, there'll be one movie that most people have probably seen, and that'll be The Fellowship of the Ring, and they'll remember who Gandalf is, and Ian McKellen's portrayal of Gandalf. I believe it was something like that, I'm paraphrasing. I've always kind of remembered that, and I kind of looked at these films in that way before I'd read that quote from Harry Knowles, but um, that I paraphrased. I always felt the cast was just so perfect and they had this aura of respect for their characters and also they were just so perfect at it. I mean Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn, he has such a presence and a steadfast leadership to him. I can never even believe that the ring would corrupt him. He has just such a strong sense of leadership about him. I believe Aragorn could take you to Mordor. You know, I, I mean, he doesn't, you know, spoilers. I really believe in him. Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn is like one of the real treats of this film because I did not know who Viggo Mortensen was before this film. And then afterwards, I think everyone knew who Viggo Mortensen was. He's incredibly attractive. He's got such a heroic stoicism about himself. You always feel like in the, while watching this film you feel Aragorn can do no wrong. He'll always do the good thing. He'll always do the right thing. And he got an elf to fall in love with him and she didn't need to do that. Ian McKellen as Gandalf is perfect. Having such a great actor with such a great voice. That deep English accent with that long beard. He was born to play Gandalf. Gandalf has a presence about him. He has to have a presence about him. Gandalf has to walk into a room and you want to look at Gandalf. And Ian McKellen already has that quality. 
Jonathan Reese Davies as Gimli, who looks almost unrecognizable. I don't even think of him as Jonathan Reese Davies. Like most of the actors, I can still think of them as real people, but Jonathan Reese Davies as Gimli, I've always just thought of him as Gimli. They did the Gimli stuff perfectly because I, n I never even see him as Gimli. You know, even when I see him on the red carpet, I'm like, what's the guy from Indiana Jones doing here? And Frodo has that longing sense of despair that Elijah Wood brought to him. I think Elijah Wood often gets forgotten because there's just so many good actors in this film. When I watch this film and that haunting score from Howard Shore, the theme to it when this film starts, there's a certain haunting element to this film and Howard Shore's score brings it out and lets it soar and soak in through your soul. And Peter Jackson, who comes kind of from horror, you know, if you watch Dead Alive, and Heavenly Creatures is a bit of a spooky film. I think he brings a spooky element to this. When there's danger, you're really afraid of it because he makes these people very, very scary. They're not just these simple two-dimensional villains. They're very spooky and scary. But as well, I think there's a real family home element to it. After I've seen all three, this was kind of the film I loved the most of all of them. But it has such a simple kind of starter sense to it. And there's no real big battle. There's nothing too big going on. There's definitely large fights, but there's no big war battle that there are in the other two films. And this film kind of feels a lot smaller in scope, even though he is trying to save the end of the world. It's a good way to start off any film franchise that's going to go on for a couple of films because it gets you so into it. It makes you want to see two other films. The Fellowship of the Ring is really more about character. You really meet Frodo and Boromir and Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli. You meet them all so that when you come around to the next film, they don't have to go through that and that you can just move on with the plot. And the other films are far more plot centric. And I think one of the best ways to build any sort of franchise is like if you get to know these characters and it's setting everybody up. I know apparently they changed a bit about the characters to make everyone have kind of an overarching arc throughout these films and it's setting up like everyone has a need. You know Aragorn needs to become the king of Gondor at some point. You know Frodo has to get rid of the ring. You know, you understand how all these arcs are starting and you're already seeing these people change but you're like, oh boy, they have so much more to go through. Every time I watch this film, I'm shocked at how visually striking it is and how well the story is told through those visuals and how those visuals lead you in even more. This is one of the best directed big epic major blockbuster films probably in the past 20 years and it really launched Peter Jackson to the point where I was like well he can't do any wrong and he made the Lord of the Rings films. I don't think his past Lord of the Rings career has been as kind to him. The promise of this film and the epicness to it and as kind of pretentious as I guess you could take these films it almost doesn't feel pretentious especially this one because it feels so homey at the beginning, it kind of eases you in, you're just in Hobbiton, you're brought in so nicely. Frankly, I just really love this movie. I love watching it every now and then. I haven't watched it in a while, now I'm excited for The Hobbit. It reminds you of being a kid because you fall in love with this whole fantasy world and you want to see how it goes and, you know, stay up way too late watching it and ignore all your responsibilities. It wraps you up like a blanket that's so comfortable and so inviting. It kind of gets you in deep, these movies. And Fellowship of the Ring is always the one that gets me in way deeper than the rest of them. So if you have seen Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, and you would like to talk about it, then comment below in the comments. And subscribe if you would like to.